everyone, and welcome to Between Two Studs. I'm Alex Stud. And I'm Ron Stud. Ron, if our podcast was a person, today they'd be able to legally drink. This is episode 21. Follow that logic that every episode is a year. All right. I'm, I'm following you. Seriously, though, this is a big milestone, 21. It is. We've made it past our 20s. No, well, we we're, we're we're in our early it, 20s. We've we're made in it into 20s. the early 20s, right? Yeah, exactly. How are you doing this evening? I, I'm doing great. Yourself? You know what? It's a Monday night. We have a great guest on tonight. Please welcome Alec Artoski. How are you doing tonight? Hey, folks. I am doing just peachy. How about you guys? Doing, doing pretty good. You know, what we do is we start our show off with what we call the Ember Round. These are questions we ask all of our guests and get to know you a little bit better. So first and foremost, the question we always ask is, where do you come into play? How do you know Ron and I? Well, I happen to say that I have been lucky enough to work with both of you two at a, <laughs> at a previous life. But yes, I worked with both studs. And I have to say, this is probably the first time I've been between two studs. Outside of maybe when we would go to that um, all-you-can-eat sushi buffet uh, oh, that, yeah. we'd, that we'd go for lunch sometimes. Oh, Ron, Ron, I was unaware that we used to expose you to that goodness. Oh, yeah. There was oh, yeah. The three of us plus Dan Hellerman. And we'd yeah. go and it'd be like $11 for all-you-can-eat sushi. And the quality reflected that $12, $11 price. The only thing that made it worthwhile is that I knew that at least if I had to go to the bathroom, they'd be paying for me to go. <laughs> <laughs> Which inevitably would definitely happen. Oh, for sure. When you're paying $12 for sushi, you are clearly getting top-level grade A sushi. <laughs> I mean, thinking back on it, though, I never got, like, ridiculously sick off of it. So they did something right. I, I think we just might have trained our bodies to be used to the crap that we put into it. <laughs> Probably. Let's just say we weren't eating super healthy for our lunches. We would We would go there sometimes, and then we'd go to Border Cafe and just eat. Like, I mean, I love Border Cafe, but just like Tex-Mex to the extreme heaviness, and then you'd go back to work. And there's no way you'd ever be productive that afternoon. Oh, no, especially Border Cafe. Border Cafe had 3 o'clock nap written all over it. You would just <laughs> you would just get to your desk at 3 o'clock and be like, probably shouldn't eat in a metric ton of chili today. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> yes, it's very true. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What are some of your areas of interest? I'm, I'm from the Philadelphia area. I've lived here my entire life. I, uh, I happen to have a hankering for travel, which is leading a little bit into what we're going to do today. But, uh, you know, I went to Drexel University here in Philadelphia. I played a lot of hockey growing up. Big Phillies fan. For the most part, uh, I just live my best life here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, jetting around. What can I say? And I like that you said the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I like it when people know their facts. They know There's only facts. four of them. I mean, for the love of God, we may as well use it. Well, people always <laughs> forget Kentucky. That's the one that people always forget. I'll say, what are the commonwealths? I don't think that's the only thing they forget about Kentucky. Well, that's true. But you know, <laughs> you know the other two? I absolutely do. It would be our friends, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Bingo. Bingo, bango. Alec, what are you drinking this evening? Well, that is an excellent question, and I have to lead into this saying that I'm a bit of an IPA beer snob. My refrigerator is only filled with pretentious beers. So I'm drinking a Force of Will. It is from an excellent brewery up in Massachusetts called Treehouse, and it is very hazy and scrum -trilescent. And is that distributed now in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? No. To make this even worse, I drove to Massachusetts to buy it. Well, I was going to say, wow. I know people who love that brewery, but it's one of those things. Like, unless you're in New England, like I didn't know you could get it out, outside of New England, and apparently maybe you can't. You, you cannot. One of my best buddies lives in Massachusetts. So when we go up there, we come back with several cases of Treehouse. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where if you're not using a hand truck on the way out, you didn't do it right. We typically leave with several hundred beers. Wow. Wow. See? You come prepared. Well, I knew you were a beer snob. If you remember, we had a business trip together to San Diego, probably the capital of IPAs. Yes, and, very and much so. 
And I remember you were very adamant about trying and exploring all that San Diego had to offer in terms of beer. What's the point of going on vacation if you're not going on a beer vacation? It wasn't That's vacation. It was a work trip. <laughs> <laughs> I was out of Philadelphia with an expense report, and you really didn't think I was going to drink as many beers as I could. With the right mindset with traveling, any business trip can become a vacation. Right. Beers are food. That's the way I look at it. My expense report covers meals, and you know what? Beer is a meal. Good enough for me. Ron, what are you drinking this evening? All right. Tonight, I'm having some Ragtime Rye, which is a New York straight rye whiskey, and this is single barrel cask strength, something I picked up on Flaviar, and uh, pretty good. Nothing to write home about, but a nice rye whiskey. What about yourself? You know, I wanted a nice little mixed drink, so tonight I'm having an Amaretta Sour. Nothing hmm. too special, but... I, I kind of wanted to change it up. Usually, I drink a lot of bourbons on this show. A little early for Derby Day, you know. Well, that's true. And and we'll get into that. I forgot, actually. Alec is big into the ponies. Mm. He, goes, he goes to all of them. So we'll touch on that a little bit later. One of the things that we do as part of our show is we ask all of our guests to basically pick some type of an art uh, that represents them. And... One of the interesting things about our guests in the past is so far, nobody has really let us down with anything that's been pedestrian. No so, pressure. So the, the bar is incredibly high. Now you tell us what song, movie, book, painting, or what have you, would you pick as a piece of art that represents you? Wow, that is a bold strategy, Cotton. Well, as Alex knows, I am quite a big history buff myself. So... <laughs> One of the, the books that I think describes me quite well is I've <laughs> been reading this book on Herbert Hoover, which I know has not been uttered by anybody in the last 55 years. I'm a big fan of the historic people that people do not remember. And I think that by reading these books about presidents that people forget about or politicians or, or historians that no one's ever heard of, um, that really describes me. And I like to consider myself one of those people where I'm doing all kinds of good stuff in the background, but nobody knows who I am. I like it that way. Is there a particular interest in Herbert Hoover in particular? Or do oh, you just, absolutely. Like, are you fascinated that the like I, what I think I've always felt bad for the guy is I feel like he always gets the blame for the Great Depression. Yet in reality, he took over as president in, I believe, 1928. And the Great Depression happened within a year of, of him taking office. Like, it really had nothing to do with him. But, of course, everyone associates the Hoovervilles and, like, all of that, all the bad things. I, I would think a lot of people would consider him, if they, if they know anything about him at all, they'd consider him a bad president. So Herbert Hoover, what is interesting about that man is he did not fail at anything in his entire life until he was president of the United States. Imagine going through your entire life not failing and being the best at everything right up until you're the most powerful man in the world and just just doesn't come together for you. That's basically what happened. But Herbert Hoover, I mean, <laughs> ironically, we've had two Quakers as president of the United States. Both are remembered for two very different things. One being Herbert Hoover, who you have mentioned gets blamed for the Great Depression. The second being good old Dick Nixon, who happened to be a Quaker from the state of California. So you could not have more left field items. But Herbert Hoover was the last of the presidents who believed that government had nothing to do with helping people. He was a firm believer that government was simply a structure that kept people in line to do commerce and defense. He was a Quaker, so he was big on society helping society, which could not be any different from FDR who rolls in right after him. It's one of those things where Herbert Hoover was Secretary of Commerce and he basically ran the country while Calvin Coolidge was president, basically. He ran all domestic affairs. Well, um, and what I like about Coolidge, and I'm sure you know this, but for the listener, he was known as Silent Cal because he was very quiet, would go to dinner parties and not say a single word. Here's the president of the United States. There were some real characters in our presidential history. Yes. And, and I mean, it was just – Herbert Hoover is just one of those guys who – basically didn't want to be president, but everybody said, you're perfect, you should be president. And you know what? That was back in those days where you didn't run for president, you were 
nominated for president. You 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 couldn't you couldn't say that you want to be president of the United States. Somebody had to tell you that you should be president of the United States, and that's when conventions and parties would just nominate people and they would take their civic duty and become president. If you said you want to be president, you were being too ostentatious and you couldn't have the job. Yeah. So, you know, it's just Herbert Hoover is just one of those guys that nobody knows anything about except for Hoovervilles and the thing that cleans your floor, which has absolutely nothing to do with Herbert. Hey, Hoover. what about the dam? Yeah, I was going to say dam, right? It's not even his dam. Yeah. But they just named it for him. I, I get your point. <laughs> and it's funny because I could talk about presidential, any president, in fact, for hours. And we're not going to do that. But I think what you brought up earlier is an important thing to point out, which is you're right. Until FDR, there wasn't this thought that it was the government's responsibility to do bailouts. It wasn't the government's responsibility to provide stimulus checks, right? It wasn't the government's job to provide any type of social security or plan. It was very much, hey, I, I, my job is, as a government is supposed to keep the nation safe. And that's kind of it, right? Promote commerce. And it wasn't until FDR and, and much later that we have kind of what we have today, where we have, whether you like it or not, these safety nets and these provisions that are, that are in place. And that all started his successor. I wouldn't go to demise, but, you know, basically Hoover's demise. But it's interesting because no president would have done anything different, right? Because FDR did something no one had ever really done before in terms of changing the role of government. So outside of wartime, the government wasn't responsible for those kinds of things, basically, yeah. up until FDR took over in the 30s. Do you kind of going back to, to how this aligns with you, do you feel that you relate to people like Hoover because, you know, they, they're, they're in a position, they're trying to do their best, but more often than not, they're either not recognized or they're even metaphorically crucified for not, not doing quote unquote enough. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I like about Hoover is that he was a guy who's I find that I'm very similar to who put his head down, did his job really well, and ultimately it led to good things. But the minute that he, they asked him to change what makes Hoover Hoover, he stood up and said, no, I'm not going to do this. And he got crucified for it, basically. So, you know, that's the thing that I've always admired Herbert Hoover about is that he kept his head down. He did his job. He did it really well. And ultimately... He ended up being crucified for it because he didn't do what ultimately people wanted him to do. You have to give somebody credit for sticking to their morals and ultimately doing what's right and maybe not what's popular. You know, I love that answer. It might be a little depressing, though. That answer in, in terms of associating that with you and a reflection of you, don't you think? Uh, I mean, it depends how you look at it. I mean, I'm one of those people where – you know what, if you could make everybody happy, you'd be Kim Kardashian. And I don't want to be Kim Kardashian. Does Kim so Kardashian I'm, make everyone happy? She's worth a billion dollars. She better. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's better to do what's right than what's popular. And I wish I could remember who said that. But that is probably one of the, the best lines in all of American history. And you know what? It's funny. What it reminds me of is so I mentioned earlier that I played hockey my entire life. And one of the things that my dad said to me that I always remember is that I played defense as a kid in the all, into college. And the best thing a defenseman can hear is that I didn't notice you on the ice. Yes. Because that means that you did your job, you played your position well, ultimately you were invisible, which means you played your position correctly. And I think I've taken that to heart, that ultimately if people, if you do your job, you're invisible, which means you're doing your job correctly congratulations you passed the ember round you've made it Ooh, i'm a little burned but you know what i feel okay i think your selection for your art it passes it passes the between two studs uh, certification process so good job excellent anyone who brings up a president as part of their art that reflects them they're good in my book it's classy so let's get on to the main part of the show and Alec, I'm going to be completely honest with you, right? Just just going to it, lay it out. The biggest reason I wanted you on our podcast is because of your expertise in all things travel. Uh, with everyone kind of like getting vaccinated, life is slowly starting to open up again. People are starting to feel comfortable getting on an airplane. 
everyone is starting to think about what is their next, their first big trip. And I don't know about you, you two, but I'm getting people asking me those questions. And I was like, who better to talk about this than my friend, Alec Artoski? So I'm totally bringing you on the show for selfish reasons so I can point people to this episode. First things first, though, a lot of people, I kid you not, don't fully understand what loyalty programs are, like frequent flyer miles. And they think I'm crazy when I tell them, whatever you do, sign up for one. Can you explain, Alec, what are they and are they worth it? I have to say that I fully understand the people that don't get the loyalty programs because they are, they are not as easy or as simple as they used to be. But the answer is yes. So I myself am a member of pretty much every frequent flyer program you could think of on Earth. When I was a kid, I went on a vacation with my parents to Paris. And at this point, I'm going to say I was, let's say, 15 or 16 years old. And just for shits and giggles, I got an Air France KLM Flying Blue Frequent Flyer number. Simply because thought it'd be a good idea to have a number on there. Why fly if they're not going to get rewarded? So on my flight home, I'm at Charles de Gaulle, and they have a computer failure. And they basically reset the computer, and they just start assigning people seats because they didn't know where anybody was. This was like the mid 2000s. So it's not like there was a lot of technology rolling around in Paris. Long story short, I get called to the desk. Woman looks at me. First thing she says is, do you speak French? I go, no, I do not speak French. And she in broken English informs me that I am being upgraded to first class on my eight hour flight home because during the computer reboot, I am AA, Alec Artaski, with a flying blue frequent flyer number, which puts me to the top of the list. And I got to fly home eight and a half hours from Charles de Gaulle in first class while my parents and my sister sat in coach. And that is a true story from Alec Artaski. Moral of the story is to change your name so that your first name and last name have start with A? Um, I wouldn't advise against it, but sometimes it works out in your favor. That is a very extreme reason to why you should have a frequent flyer number. But my advice to those of you out here that are not as well educated in this as I am is that you should have a frequent flyer number for one airline in one of the three airline alliances. And for those of you playing along at home, those would be Star Alliance, One World, woo woo. and Sky Team. All right. Now, as, as the person who's on the outside of things tell me what's cool with each one of them if if we're using game of thrones references that's cool too explain to me why you know alex he's associating with one world alliance which one of these is cool and which one is not so cool and which one do you all make fun of on the side well so more than anything else i think it really depends on where you live yeah so in the united states all of the airlines are pretty much terrible. I'll be the first to admit that. But many of them are very convenient. So I myself happen to be a member of One World because I fly American Airlines because I live in Philadelphia. I was a US Airways Dividend Miles member for a lot of years. US Air got purchased, actually US Air purchased American. They rebranded themselves as American and they own Philadelphia. So for me, I fly One World simply because it is convenient to me. I don't have to stop as much. That's the biggest thing, in my opinion, is based on what city you're in, especially if you live in a city with a hub, like Ron, you live in Atlanta. It'd be silly for you not to be a loyal, have a frequent flyer number with Delta, right? It, it just, right. It, 90% of the flights that go out of Atlanta are Delta flights, right? Why wouldn't you? And I yeah. live in, in Chicago. I live very close to O'Hare which is both a United and an American hub. So theoretically, I could actually do either. And of course, I have frequent flyer numbers for both, but I primarily fly American. Right. So in my opinion, and again, this is my humble opinion, of the three American airlines, is, I think Delta has the best product, personally. Hmm. I think their product is the best. I think it's the most comfortable. I think it's the newest fleet. It's the best one to fly. But that doesn't make a difference to me because I live in Philadelphia. So I continue to fly my old school Airbus 321s out of Philadelphia that used to work the U.S. Airways planes for 20 years ago because that means I don't have to stop anywhere in between. If I lived in New York, 
where you have access to all three airlines, I would be a Delta frequent flyer member. That's the way that I always look at it. If I lived in Manhattan, I would fly Delta. So if like you moved to New York and you've always been a United guy, right? Should you switch or is there even a way that you can switch your allegiances? So there is, and it really comes down to sort of like who you are as a person. If you fly a lot, people like like myself that fly a lot for work, there is a potential that you could be a member of what they call the Million Mile Club, which means if you ever fly a million miles in your life, you get status every year for the rest of your life, regardless of if you ever fly again. On that airline. On that airline. And then that ultimately would transfer over to their One World Sky Team Star Alliance members. Now, if you are not close to that or don't think you will ever hit that, it's actually very easy to switch. It really comes down to who you are. As an example, if you are a frequent flyer like I am myself, a lot of airlines do status matches where they will match your current status on a competitor to see that you can have this status on this airline. And ultimately, if you like it, you can then just transfer your, your travel from point A to point B and you ultimately collect those. There might be, if your airline that you're potentially interested in switching to does not have a match, you might have to sort of eat it for a little bit and fly coach until you can get up to status. But primarily, you can easily switch between them if you fly enough as a person. If you are just a small family that travels to Florida once a year to go to Disney World, it doesn't matter what airline you fly because you're simply just looking for the best deal. Business travelers and frequent flyers are ultimately looking to gain status. That's really what you're looking for. And if you can gain status on an airline, and it is easier to earn them on some versus others, and some have quirks that others do not, you basically have to pick one. Because if you don't, you're spreading yourself out too thin, and that means that ultimately you're going to fail on all three. It really comes down to where you live, in my opinion, and ultimately where you are flying. Out of Philadelphia, as an example, flying American Airlines in one world, I have easy access to British Airways and Iberian, which means going to Europe for me is very easy. And but explain it, why that is, because they're both part of the one world alliance. Right. So these airlines, what they have learned to do is that they have basically joined together as a, as a unit to basically cut their cost and share flights. We call them co-shares. So if you're flying from Philadelphia to, let's say, Copenhagen, from Philadelphia, you're not going to get a nonstop flight from Copenhagen. So you're going to have to stop somewhere in Europe to get there. So most likely what you'll do is you'll fly Philadelphia to London and then London to Copenhagen. But that flight from London to Copenhagen will not be an American Airlines operated flight. It'll be British Airways, Iberian, Aer Lingus, simply because what American is doing is they're simply passing the baton in London to one of those airlines and they'll get you there. So these alliances are simply ways to reduce costs for airlines, but ultimately open up the world based on who you are. Because I book all this through American Airlines. I don't have to book one leg through American and the other leg through British Airways. It's all one unit. I book them all together. So these alliances are simply airlines working with other airlines to ultimately reduce their cost and make it easier for your passengers to get from point A to point B. And the way that they do that is by linking all the rewards programs together and basically agreeing on if my customer is X, I will give your customer the same, the same quality of service if you have the same customer type status type deal. And the best part, of course, is that flight from wherever Europe you, you originated after you flew from Philadelphia to Copenhagen, you're going to get American Airline miles for that. And that is truly one of the best deals of these alliances is that, so Ron, for an example, if you were to fly from Atlanta to anywhere in the world, you can collect Sky Miles as long as you fly a Sky Team operated flight. Now, there are some, there are some uh, exceptions to that where I can fly airlines that are not in alliances but st still earn miles, but that is few and far between. But for the most part, what it is, it's convenience. It's convenience and cost cutting. I, as American, don't have to operate as many flights if British Airways will operate some of those flights for me. As well as, if I'm American, I can get them to Europe, and then I don't have to worry about getting them from London to Copenhagen. I pass the baton. It's somebody else's problem. 
and it's the same quality. They integrate computer systems. It really just makes life a lot easier because if you think about it, if this did not exist today, like back in the days of Pan Am, Pan Am gets you to Tokyo and say you want to move on to Australia. Well, you're got to operate with a different customer, recheck your luggage, go through security again, clear customs. It's a whole ordeal. It's not worth it. So these alliances ultimately make your life easier as a consumer, and it makes the airline industry cheaper by not having to operate as many flights. And all these flights will add up and be counted towards your primary airline. So in this case, for Ron, it would be Delta. And it helps you get status quicker. And of course, the benefit of status is you get multipliers as it relates to the, the amount of miles you get per flight, as well as in terms of think, free things like check bags or how early you can board your flight, all those things, right? And over time, it can really make the difference for someone who's flying frequently. Now, that, It really you, does. It absolutely does. And I'll say this, Ron, one of the things you brought up earlier, and it's a good point, like, okay, so I live in Chicago, Delta doesn't have a presence. If I were to move to Atlanta tomorrow, me and my wife, I would absolutely call Delta up and say, hey, I'm gold status on American. Can you match that status on Delta? And more often than not, they'll say, yes, we'll honor that through the end of the year. And it makes sense because on their end, they're saying, here's someone who clearly flies a lot. We know they fly a lot because they flew American and they got to gold status on American. So if we can make their life convenient and get them to experience Delta, we'll give them a little bit of taste of, of that goodness, right? Of, of being having status on Delta and they'll stop flying American and fly Delta. So yeah, the point is you should absolutely play that game. And a lot of people do. The way that airline travel works is that airline travel is directed to people that fly a lot. And if you don't fly a lot, they basically don't care. The story that I hear from people all the time is, oh, traveling is such a pain. I hate to travel. The process is annoying and confusing and takes forever. And my immediate response is, no offense, you're not doing it correctly. Because traveling is a science as much as it is an art. If you are a once a year flyer, I hate to break it to you. Your life's going to be miserable for the, till the day you die if it comes to air travel. You're never going to get anywhere. But if you have a minimal amount of air travel and you can somehow finagle away into getting status or even you can get credit cards that will give you lounge access, there are ways that you can engineer air travel to work for you. But ultimately, the whole idea behind a frequent flyer number is that an airline has a marketing information system for you, meaning that they know that you took the time and effort to put your name on a list. That means we can target you for things. And ultimately, you might fly us more because you have this number. Now, because miles don't expire anymore, that's also a much better thing is everybody on earth should have a frequent flyer number for one of the three alliances because Why miles not? no longer expire. You should get them for all three. They're free to sign up. And they never expire. So it used to be back in the day that if you didn't fly every 12 months, you lost your miles. But now that, that no longer exists. So if you fly once a year and say you fly from New York to, to Orlando every year, in 10 years, you'll get a free flight. So if you do that flight every year, the 10th year, it's a free flight. If you didn't put that number in, people go, oh, but I don't fly enough. It's like anything else. Interest is interest. Collection is collection. It, it better to get something than nothing. So to answer the original question, everybody should have a frequent flyer number for all three alliances. Now, that doesn't mean you should have American United Delta. There are instances where you might want to have an alliance to a company that doesn't operate in the United States. But either way, you're going to be able to earn those points. And each system has their own little tricks and their own little caveats. Uh, as an example, British Airways earns miles based on distance, not on cost. Whereas American Airlines, you earn your flight, you earn frequent flyer miles based on how much money you spend. So if you don't fly very far, but you spend a lot of money, American might be your best bet. But if you fly a lot and you get these really good, sweetheart, cheap deals, maybe you want to go BA. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can skin the cat per se, but the moral to the story is you should at least have three frequent flyer numbers at a very minimum, and you should be earning something versus earning nothing. We're going to go to break, but I have one last question. Very short, yes or no, before we do. 
So Alec, similar situations. You have you have a flight. You got to go to Denver. I'm just picking random from Philadelphia. And let's just say there's a direct flight on American and a direct flight with United. United flight's fifty dollars cheaper. Are you going to spend the extra fifty bucks to fly an American? Uh, for fifty dollars, yes. My rule of thumb is it's got to be over a hundred bucks for me to consider. That's simply because I am American Airlines Platinum, which means I get two free check bags. I get to pick my seat, and you sort of have to value what convenience is worth to you. So, in my mind, I start I start the bidding at let's say a hundred dollars, and if your flight is more expensive than a hundred bucks, I really begin to think about it. I've been flying a lot of Frontier lately, simply because it's so darn cheap. As and long as you're willing to fly through Denver. Anywhere you want to go as long as it's Denver. And I happened to do a status match with them at the beginning of the year. For 50 bucks, they match my American Airlines status. I'm what's considered Frontier 50K, which to this day, I still don't know what that means. But what that does mean is that I get to pick a seat on Frontier. Uh, I get to carry on a bag for free. But moral to the story is, It really comes down to what you value. Do you value your time and your convenience more or less than a dollar? And I have to say that my number that I've discerned is that $100 is where I begin to evaluate whether or not I will fly something else. And that makes perfect sense. And I think I would give a similar answer. It also depends on how long it is. Right. But I think I would give a similar answer. But of course, the skeptics and the cynics would say, well, that's how American Airlines wins. They can charge you up to $100 and they still get Alex business. If they were not making money, it wouldn't happen. Let's put it that way. They're not stupid. If they didn't think this made money, they wouldn't participate in this program. Speaking, so, speaking of money, we're going to go to a commercial break. But when we come back, the other question that people always ask is, okay, I can get my frequent flyer miles, but what credit card should I be using to make the purchase? When we come back, we're going to talk about that. We'll be right back. What's up, guys? This is Ruben. You may remember me as being the first ever guest on the Between Two Studs podcast. I'm here now to promote my podcast, Guys Who Cry. Me, along with my co-host, Adam Cook, we talk about a wealth of topics ranging from crying, men crying, because it's something we all do, to, you know, some lighter things. Uh, For example, our newest episode, Adam and I talked about our dating blunders and just weird date stories. So guys, if you'd be so kind, head on over to Spotify, Anchor, Apple, iTunes, and hit that follow button. Talk to us. Our Instagram is at guys who cry official. That is guys who cry official. Check us out. We love to hear from you. And we're back. Hanging out with Alec Artoski. We were just talking about the world of frequent flyer miles. Alec, the next natural question that everyone always asks me. Okay, so I have the flight I want to pick out, right? And I got my frequent flyer mile number. I signed up. Now I got to decide credit card. How do I pay for the flight or the hotel? And everyone always asks me this, and I feel like you're the most qualified person I know to answer this. How do you best gain the credit card system? And quite frankly, how many credit cards are currently in your arsenal? Ooh, that's an embarrassing question. For starters, there really is an important caveat to credit cards. And I I will give you my opinion, and I'll let you take this and run with it. But ultimately, airline credit cards are useless. You should not have an airline credit card unless you have a very specific reason. Because airline credit cards mean that you earn airline miles, and airline miles get devalued all the time. So when I refer to devalued, American controls, United controls, Delta controls what those points are worth. So you could have 100,000 points on a Tuesday, and that could mean that you can fly round trip to St. Louis. And on a Thursday, it could mean that you can't get in a rental car and drive to St. Louis. So it really depends on what you are looking to gain. Many airline credit cards have the ability to earn some kind of kicker for status if you spend enough money. So you might find value that way. But in my opinion, what you are looking for in a good airline travel credit card 
is a credit card with what we call transferable miles, which means you earn chase points, you earn Amex points, you earn city thank you points, you earn Capital One venture points, because those points can't be devalued because those companies are simply using them to be transferred to other companies. I know that's a bit of a convoluted answer, but that really is the truth. You shouldn't use a credit card that earns airline miles. You should use use a credit card that earns transferable miles. Is it fair to say that your your argument is in part one, the airlines could devalue their, their own point system, but number two, you're also limited only to that airline. Right, you can only use American airline miles for American airlines versus if you use a universal point system like Chase Points, well, you can use those Chase Points for theoretically any airline that you wanted. Right. In theory, you could use American Airlines miles to buy like British Airways flights and stuff, which goes back to our conversation about alliances earlier. But it really comes down to the fact that, as an example, American Airlines has, I believe at this point, like 20 transfer partners, which means if I earn American Airlines membership points, that means I'm really earning transferable airline points on 20 airlines. So I could find a really good deal on an airline in Europe. I can use those points to fly domestically in the United States. And I know that's a little left feet. But the whole idea behind transferable points is that American Airlines membership points are membership points. They're not going to devalue those. Very worse, you can redeem them for one cent in American Airlines. But you can find huge value spots in transferring points from American Airlines, Chase, Capital One, Citibank, to other airlines, which can ultimately end up you making money on a flight versus paying cash out of pocket. And that makes sense. But you said there are exceptions. And I would think the biggest exception would be lounge status. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So every big airline in the world, specifically in the United States, American, Delta, and United, have a premium credit card product. So what that means is that in the credit card world, uh, there are many ways you can look at this. In today's credit card world, there are really three categories of credit card. There is a premium credit card product, which has a very high annual fee. There is a middle of the road credit card product, which has a reasonable annual fee. And then there are credit cards that have no annual fees. It's like the saying, you have to spend money to make money. If you are looking to ultimately get free lounge access and you don't travel a whole lot, American, Delta, and United are willing to offer you a product that will get you into the lounge system without having any status. So as an example, American Airlines has the executive platinum card, which will get you into all Admiral lounges, but it'll cost you $450 a year. Delta has a very comparable card known as the Delta Reserve card, very comparable. United has a, I believe, the United Explorer Infinity card. I think that's what it's called. So you can ultimately basically bribe your way in by buying a credit card with a high annual fee. It really comes down to if you are really desiring lounge access, you can buy or pay for a high annual fee credit card, which ultimately will get you into lounges without having status. Well, and and I would make the argument that for someone like me, every time I go to an airport and they have a lounge, I always go in for the American Airlines lounge, right? And the value that I get every time I go, I usually grab a complimentary beer I usually, they always have little soups or, you know, little, little snacks, right? Hummus and cheese. I sit down and unwind before my flight. I would say every time I go to the lounge, I'm getting a 40 to $50 value. In my opinion, that's what I'm quantifying the value as. So when you look at the card and you go, okay, well, it's a $450 annual fee, but you go, okay, well, what's 450 for Alex divided by 40? Okay, well, it's 11.25. So if I go to the lounge 12 times a year, which for some people that might be crazy. I don't go, I don't fly that often. But for someone like me or you, Alec, that's pretty reasonable, right? Especially you can bring a plus one with you. So all of a sudden, okay, well, it's not just me going, it's me and my wife going. All right, well, now all of a sudden it's actually six times that I'm going, right? Six, right. six unique times. Well, clearly I'm getting the value in that, in that sense. 
Well, Alex, should I share our little secret around American Airlines and the executive credit card? Are we willing to give it to your listening public? I would say as long as you're not worried that people are going to you know, close, close the loop, the loophole. No, I, I, I would be shocked if our little, our little uh, scheme is, is killing American Airlines. So I will share a, a top secret tip here today with you folks. The American Airlines executive credit card allows you to have up to nine authorized users at no additional cost. So if you know nine people that also want to get into the Admiral Lounge, you can very simply apply for this credit card, have them be one of your authorized users, and then split the annual fee at the end of every year. I will not admit to saying that I have done this or that I continue to do it, but I have heard that it is possible (laughs) and that you can take this credit card and divvy it up nine ways and ultimately pay $45 a year and have access to the Admiral Lounges if you're flying American Airlines. And every one of those people who are an authorized user have access to the lounge and could also bring in a plus one. So very you quickly. Could actually bring two guests. Oh, is it two? Okay. So very quickly, in, in my analogy where I, I tie it to a $40 per person per use, you bring your wife and your kid one time you just got $120 value for a $50 credit card, $45 credit card. It's pretty crazy. You get it for the year. So people always ask me, well, I don't need a lounge. What do you, you know, I'm not spending that much time in the airport. And that is a very valid argument right up until you get stuck in an airport at a rain delay or a thunderstorm or a snowstorm. And you will immediately realize that you made a mistake and that <laughs> you should be in the lounge right now. I gotta um, say, I show up intentionally to the airport extra early because I like to grab a beer. I like to catch up on some emails and just kind of relax. I don't want to have to rush to the airport last minute. So for me, by having the lounge actually like gives me that peace of mind where yeah, I'm gonna go chill. I'm gonna go hang out in the lounge for an hour. I don't have to. I don't have to sit in the nasty seats with the McDonald's grease stain on them. And I have to say during COVID too, especially it has been a, a godsend in keeping yourself out of the, the general public simply because you're separating yourself out. There's less interaction. You have a, a less chance of interacting with somebody that might have COVID. It does have its values. I will say that it is definitely worth it if you are in an airport probably 10 times a year. I would say it's probably worth it. But there is one caveat to this. We talked about alliances at the beginning of this. Just because American allows you access to the Admiral Lounges with your American Airlines executive credit card does not mean that gets you into British Airways lounges or Iberian's lounges or Cathay Pacific's lounges. So if you are purely a domestic American Airlines, Delta, or United Air Traveler, this might be the way to go for you. Now, to go off on my little tangent about the premium credit cards, I think it's important that we sort of outline what a premium credit card is, a mid-range credit card is, and a free credit card is. So before people have sticker shock, a premium credit card is somewhere between $300 and $700 a year. I'll let that sink in for a second. But ultimately, there is value in paying for the credit card. As an example, if you happen to be somebody who would want an American Express Platinum credit card, that allows you access to American express specific lounges that are scattered all over the country there's about 10 of them now i believe there's def uh, i know for a fact there's one in philadelphia dfw las vegas lax there's a bunch of them they're very nice they're they're very pleasant and they'll that credit card will get you in regardless of what airline you fly then you also have the ability from these premium credit cards to get a program known as priority pass and priority pass will get you into lesser known lounges it's not as valuable in the united states But if you are a big Alaskan Airlines flyer, or if you happen to fly out of Florida or Georgia, there are the, what they call the club, there's quite a few clubs, but Priority Pass also gets you into airport lounges, regardless of what airline you're flying. It comes down to, and I I will present, there are three in my mind, high-end premium credit cards that are worth looking at. There is the American Airlines Platinum credit card, costs you about $550 a year. There is the Chase Sapphire Reserve credit card, which will also cost you about $550 a year. And then there is the City Prestige card, which I believe is, I want to say it's $450 a year. I don't actually know off the top of my head. Like the Chase Sapphire Reserve, you and I both have that card. Can you explain 
like, okay, well, it's, it's five fifty a year, but right from the jump, you get a $300 travel voucher. Right. And as you get deeper into the weeds here, what is important to know is that the annual fee is not ultimately what you will be paying at the end of the year. Because as Alex has alluded to, it's a $550 credit card just to physically have. But they will give you $300 back on anything that is considered travel that you make expenses for. Simply things like parking, tolls, Uber, public transportation, Uber, rental cars, hotels, airfare. That comes right off the top, right off the day. So at the beginning, if you have $300 in general travel-related expenses every year, you're reducing the annual fee of this credit card down to $250, which is a bargain. Because what you also get are some of the indus- the top of the industry standards for things like travel insurance that are automatically built into your credit card. Things like primary rental car insurance, which means if you wreck a rental car, you're not calling your insurance company. You're calling chase the ability to get things like global entry and uh tsa pre-check and not to mention that every time you use this credit card for anything that is considered dining or travel you get three times the points that you spend and these points are generally worth two cents a piece you can redeem them for a cent and a half if you were to buy a physical ticket from chase but you can transfer them to other partners, which makes them more valuable, which goes back to this initial conversation of, okay, I have 100,000 chase points. I can physically buy a flight with those chase points, or I can transfer those chase points to British Airways and fly a domestic American Airlines ticket, and it won't cost me anything. So the whole concept behind these premium credit cards is that you are building transfer partners that ultimately give you the ability to make value off your expenses. And in the end, credit cards, if you have a if you are using a debit card for anything, you should stop because you can easily make money off credit cards without having to debit things. So you don't need a premium credit card, but premium credit cards carry perks that make your life a flyer or domestic or international flyer substantially easier and provide you more value. I was always a little skeptical of paying a credit card company $450 plus so I can use that credit card until you experience a couple uh uh-oh problems and they're taken care of. There was a flight not that long ago, like two years ago, where I was flying home, me and my wife from Philadelphia back to O'Hare. I'm up in the air. I'm flying up near Pittsburgh, and they literally turned the plane around. There was a big thunderstorm in Chicago. They brought the plane and landed back in Philadelphia. It's midnight. Everyone went home because we were the last flight out. And they were like, there, there was no one even there to help us out, to, to help deboard the plane. Everyone went home. And I said, well, we're screwed. What are we going to do? I called up my credit card, Chase. And they said, Mr. Stud, yeah, we, we see what happened to your, your flight because you purchased the flight with our credit card, go ahead, get yourself a rental car if you want, or Uber, go get a hotel, whatever you want. You have up to $600 credit paid for by the credit card. And they did. Everything got expensed. We didn't pay a dime. Even we, all of our food, breakfast, and all the travel and the hotel completely comped because it was all covered under that credit card, the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And it's one of those things where you don't realize its value until you need it. I have to say that my lifestyle allows me to find value with these credit cards every year, simply because I earn enough in travel credits and redemptions that it always pays for itself every year. But I will say though, you don't need a premium credit card to be successful with credit cards. The top tier, in my opinion, are the three that I mentioned, the Prestige, the Platinum, and the reserve. However, the mid tier has some huge values that you could definitely cash in on. So the two best mid tier credit cards by far are the Capital One Venture Card and the City, or excuse me, and the the Chase Sapphire Preferred Card. Those cards will cost you $95 a year, but there is a ton of value in there. And the Capital One Venture Card has really come on hard the last couple of years. So it used to be, and I'm sure you've all seen those terrible 
Alec Baldwin commercials with what's in your wallet. But these points are now transferable, which means you can take these points that you learn on Capital One and transfer them over to travel partners and find huge value. I mean, these credit cards, you can transfer these out. So the one that I always refer to as a Chase customer is British Airways. You can use these Chase points and transfer them to British Airways to fly domestically on American Airlines, going back to the alliances, for 25 to 30% less than you would on American. City, you can transfer to an airline known as Avianca, which operates in South America. You can fly business class on Lufthansa to Europe for like 60,000 points, which is like nothing. And then the best one by far is you can use uh, your American Airlines points, transfer those to Virgin Atlantic, which is a British company, and fly first class from the United States to Tokyo for 60,000 points, which is basically nothing. So the point that I, I would like to make here is that earning a single currency isn't necessarily bad. It's just not as valuable. So these transfer partners are really valuable in the sense that I am earning something that is worth more to one customer than it is a different customer, which means your options are more open. So I know credit cards are complicated. I know this whole travel industry is designed to be complicated, but you should do your best to get a credit card that earns transferable points that you can then utilize to make your life easier. Final question about credit cards, because you didn't answer it earlier. I know you're big about the promotions. You'll sign up for a credit card for the promotions. How many credit cards do you have right now? 21. <laughs> Wait, I know like when you're on the air, when you're on the flight, they will do those promotions. It'll come by and they'll say, well, if you sign up today, have you ever done those? Are those even worth it? They're not worth it because you, you get like 500 points for doing it on the plane typically for doing it. And I will say though, if you're going to get the credit card, do it on the plane because those flight attendants get a kickback for you doing it there. So if you're going to give somebody money, you may as well give it to the people on board the aircraft is the way I look at it. But uh, I have not simply because I think I have them all. Okay. <laughs> but if I'm hearing you correctly and you're, you're helping me to stretch my dollar, if I get a credit card while on the plane, do you think I might be able to get myself a free drink? Mm, that's that. a great question. And you know what? I'm going to try this the next time I fly to see whether or not that works. I like it. I'll have to report back. We'll have to do a follow-up session. Okay. All right, Alex. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. You started your career inside sales. And I know you worked with Alex in that sales environment, but what was it like being 22, 23 year old kids making 200 calls a day and setting up demos for a startup software company? So I have to say, I got the good end of the stick on that one is I wasn't actually making the phone calls. Alex would, I would make Alex make all those phone calls, the ones that he considered opportunistic. And then I would have to try and make this person who runs the front end of a pharmacy try and buy software. So back in so, those battles, so that's that's kind of like um, applying it to the Wolf of Wall Street. Alex is kind of like the the Jordan that just walked in first day, and everyone's like, "Yeah, you don't, you shut up and you dial." And once you get somebody who's actually not garbage, that transfers to to Alec, right? Yep, that's basically how that worked. Is cool. that we had a team of Alexes that found opportunities that got punted to me, and then I got to show them the product and ultimately, hopefully, get them to a point where they were going to try and buy something. Back in the bad old days, we were make, you know, Alex was making 200 calls a day. I was given somewhere between 10 and 30 demos a day, hoping that these people would be interested enough to, to push this along. So definitely uh, what I would consider grunt work, but I have to say it has made me a better salesperson simply because you get more at-bats, and the more at-bats you have, the more you iron this stuff out. Alec, but talk about the environment. I mean, what was going on on the sales floor, but then all of a sudden, once the workday ended? Talk about some of that. Oh, God. Well, I'll give you my one of my favorite stories is that back when we were a classified startup, we would do happy hours every other Friday. And I'll never forget this. The, the founder of our company, the CTO, we would go out to a bar, which I think is, was Two Stones. I'm going to pretend it was Two Stones. And he would put his credit card on the desk or at the, on the bar 
And he said, as long as my credit card is sitting on this bar, I'm buying all the drinks. And being an opportunistic 21-year-old kid, we were ordering $100 scotches. We were ordering, you know, anything that we thought we could get our hands on because what do I know? And then when that credit card came off the bar, you were on your own. But it was two hours of whatever you want, you get, anything goes. You know, back in the bad old days when startups had, you can do anything you want with all the money on the table. But those were, those were some good times when it was, the sales team was the average age was like 22, 23. And we were just kids who had free drinks at a bar and you would just figure it out from there, basically. Let's just say a lot of people came to work hungover and there was a lot of incestuous behavior happening as well. You've been living in the Philadelphia area for some time now. Tell us what makes Philadelphia such a special city for you. So, I mean, I've lived, uh, I went to school here. Uh, I've lived in the Philadelphia County for, it'll be 10 years as of September that I live in Philadelphia County. What is great about, it's the same thing that makes Chicago great or New York great, is that for starters, Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods. So my neighborhood is my domain. Like everybody has their little section. And in my neighborhood, I've got my grocery store, my bar, my restaurants, all that kind of stuff. What's funny is that if I were to meet you on a plane, as an example, and you were to tell me you were from Philadelphia, the first question I would ask you is what neighborhood are you from? Because that tells me a lot about you as a person. So Philadelphia is very diverse in the way that we're built. I mean, we're old. Uh, the, I have to thank William Penn for building a city with straight roads. But for the most part, it's really just there's a lot of culture, a lot of ethnicity here. It's very like melting pot esque. It's, I mean, I know we get a bad rap, but there's the, you know, there's some interesting people that live in this city. Uh, we got sports teams. It's really easy to get around. But more than anything else, it's just the people that live here. Like Philly is truly a melting pot. There's anything, you can do anything from anybody. There's bars, restaurants, clubs, concert venues, dive bars, all the stuff you're looking for in a city. Our benefit is that I personally think the thing that makes Philadelphia great is that we hide between D.C. and New York. We can do whatever we want, live our kind of life. We have a slogan here in Philadelphia, keep New York out of Philadelphia. Because we're just our own entity that operates our own way. But we truly, if anybody's ever watched an Eagles game, you know who we are, and you'll never forget that you met us. Someone who's never been to Philadelphia before. They fly into town, they meet up with you, and they say, I don't want the touristy thing. I don't want to go to Pachogino's. I don't even care if it's a cheesesteak. Let's get something authentic delicious and uniquely Philadelphia for lunch or dinner. What are you getting? Where are you taking them? Uh, well, there's only one place you can take somebody, which is you go to Red and Terminal Market and you'll take them to Denix. Yes. Uh, so the broccoli it, Rob. If yes. you are if you don't want to do the touristy things, I will take you to Red and Terminal, which is a giant old school market in the middle of Philadelphia that has about every food item you could possibly think of. But the thing that is particularly famous is this place called Denix. And we actually have this argument in Philadelphia as to what is the official sandwich of Philadelphia. Obviously, the thing everybody knows is the cheesesteak. But usually, from the locals, it is a pulled pork sandwich in a good Italian roll with broccoli rob, which is this tart lettuce-like item, and very, very sharp provolone cheese. It's um, fantastic. And I always tell people the same thing. I always say, you go to Philadelphia, sure, get yourself a cheesesteak. But if you really want to be blown away, go to the Knicks. Actually, what I always tell people is I always say, go with two people. Go with you and your buddy. Because there's a line every every one of these restaurants inside of Reading Terminal Market. I say, one of you gets in the line at the Knicks and gets the broccoli rob, one of you gets in line at Herschel's and get a Reuben sandwich. You get one one of each, and then you split skis. So you get a half of sandwich of each. And let me tell you, you something. You get Bassett's on the way out. You get yourself uh, a good, mm. authentic um, Amish ice cream. You go to Bassett's on the way out. But I will say the one thing that is funny about – the longer you live in Philadelphia, 
Pats and Geno's and Jim's and Tony Luke's and, you know, they're cheesesteaks, but you don't go there. I haven't been to Pats or Geno's or Jim's in probably two or three years because a good cheesesteak really relies on about two things. And you can get a really good cheesesteak just about anywhere in Philadelphia. But realistically, everybody in Philly who lives in Philly has their own cheesesteak place that is not Pat's, Gino's, Jim's, Tony Luke's, or Delisandro's. Because those are considered the touristy places. You don't go there to get a steak. You go get your own steak somewhere in Philadelphia, a little hole in the wall that only you and 500 people go to get cheesesteaks from. I've met people who say the real secret to a good cheesesteak, it's got to be on an Amorosa bread. Do if you, you don't serve a cheesesteak on an Amorosa roll, you're doing it wrong. So there we go. We've heard it. We've heard it there. I have traveled all over this country, and I will stop at any place in America that has a sign on the wall or the door that says we use Amorosa rolls. I kid you not. If I am in like a, a – I was in Aspen, Colorado. And on the front of this door, it says, we use Amorosa rolls. And I stopped and I went in there. And I will roll the dice on any cheesesteak in America if you put on the door, I use Amorosa rolls. Because that means you know what you're doing. You How took was the time the place? And How was the place in Aspen? They made the crucial mistake. They did not use Cheese Whiz. Oh. Uh, well, you know, so my quick take on this. And Ron and I, I forget, we may have mentioned this on a previous episode. I will always get the whiz wit in the city limits of Philadelphia. If I'm outside, why don't you explain what whiz wit is? Because that's a very colloquial thing. So, I can, so when it comes to Philly, and when you order, you order the cheese first. So the cheese is either whiz, Provo. I don't know what the others are. American, but that's American, which I don't know why you do that, but whatever. And then it's wid or without so that's with or without onions so the idea is when you go in line at the Knicks or wherever you want to go you say whiz wid they know exactly what you're saying it's cheese whiz. Well, there's, there's no there's nothing else you need to say right that's right. It's, it's literally whiz wit is what you right. say right if whiz with onions and that's it right go right. in the waiting line i mean i gotta say it's Alex, efficient i hope you're not offended by this Let's just say Philadelphia, known as the city of brotherly love. I got to say, there's a lot of New York. Uh, hey, hurry Get up, buddy. Order. Hurry up, buddy. What do you want? Right. I don't think – I think it's unfair to say that New York owns the owns the copyright on, hey, get your ass in gear, get your thing done. Because I have been all up and down the eastern seaboard, and I have to say that it doesn't matter where you are – between the Maryland border and the Canadian border, if you take your sweet ass time doing something, I'm going to tell you to hurry up. So, you know, I will say in Philly, the one thing that we have is that if you don't, if we don't tolerate indecision when it comes to cheesesteaks, if you get to the window and you don't know what you want, it's like the soup Nazi episode from Seinfeld. If you sit there and twiddle your fingers on top of that thing and try and figure out what you want, we will tell you to get to the back of the line because it's not that hard. It's three items. Now, if you want something different, we'll serve it to you different, but you better know when you get to that front of that line. Otherwise, I'm either going to give you the deep sigh or I'm going to kick you to the back of the line and have you try again. And I have seen it done. So getting back to this, though, I will always order whiz wit in the city limits of Philadelphia because somehow the whiz tastes good. I don't know why. Wiz, when someone first told me, hey, yeah, get this like fake Velveeta like substance. Whoa, on your whoa, steak. whoa. Uh uh. Don't give me this nonsense. It is a cheese like item. Velveeta is real cheese. This is a cheese like item. Oh, so you're offended can... because Velveeta is better than this Wiz? No, it is DuPont cheese. It is 100% <laughs> DuPont cheese. But you know what? It's our DuPont cheese. So if you get a cheesesteak, I, I, I hold. Tony Luke's accountable for the fact that they put American cheese on their cheesesteaks when you order them, because that is not option number one. You have to ask for American cheese. It, if you are a real cheesesteak place in Philadelphia County, you have one option. It is whiz wit, whiz wit out. And if it's not one of those, 
you are doing something wrong. And I will always hold Tony Luke's accountable for that because that is sacrilegious. So, so I totally get you on that. And I agree in the city limits, I'm getting whiz wit, but I leave the city. Even if I'm in like Bucks County or Delco, I am going to get like provolone. I, I, I'm not now, getting at that point. That's not a cheesesteak in my mind. At that point, you've made a steak sandwich. That's very interesting. So, so in this case, you went to Aspen, and I simply ordered a cheesesteak with onions. That's all I said. Oh, they didn't, because, ask, they didn't ask what kind of cheese you wanted. Uh, I set this up for failure. I specifically asked them. I would like a cheesesteak with onions, and they use strips of white American cheese, mm. and they put they put fried onions in it. And you know what? It wasn't bad, but I was offended by the fact that they did not use cheese whiz. They imported the rolls, but not the proper cheese. It's like, why Why did they go that far and not make the extra step? Just, It'd be just like if I ordered order. deep dish and I simply got, I went all the way, I paid for this dude to ship me this beautiful crust from Chicago and I went out and I bought ragu and I just filled it with ragu. Yeah. Like okay. you do all that work and then you go, ah, screw it. They don't need the right cheese. Well, you know, that cheese was anyway. I will say this. You have to take it with a grain of salt anytime you go anywhere outside of the Philadelphia area and you see Philly cheese. And it, and it oh, usually has right. the word Philly in quotation marks. Philly cheesesteak. I just go, yeah, you no know, thanks. My favorite it. ever that I've ever seen. And I only know this because I watched somebody order it. Is they ordered a Philly cheesesteak, and this was Indiana. And the guy took a roll and stuck an actual steak in the roll and put cheese on it. I kid <laughs> like, you not. Like a New they York took, strip? Literally took a steak, an actual like filet or ribeye, clearly stuck it in a roll and stuck cheese on it and said, here, eat this. And I, it took every ounce of power for me not to go to them and say, what is wrong with you? Like, I'm sure you could have Googled what a cheesesteak was and you stuck a steak in a roll and claimed that was a cheesesteak. I would have rather gone to Subway. At least they're going to chop the steak up and stick it in a roll. You just took a piece of meat and shoved it in a roll and told me it's a cheesesteak. I well, should this, sue you. This does actually bring up a very important question, though. I know we talked about how we all believe the broccoli, Rob, is superior. But we are talking about cheesesteaks right now. Do you prefer sliced or diced of the of the meat itself? Because I, in the city of Philly, I've seen them both done. I don't know right. if there's an official way or not. I think it's just preference. So Jim's and uh, Gino's, I believe, dice, which – um, and then Pat's slices. What do you prefer? So I, I have to say that I prefer the sliced. However, my favorite steak in Philly from the major people is Jim's, and that's diced. So I prefer the sliced, but Jim's steaks are superior to the others, despite the fact they're diced. I prefer diced in general, just from a consistency standpoint, because sometimes with the sliced, I feel like I'm pulling when i'm biting it's when i'm pulling out like the next part of the of the of the sandwich so if you're a tourist and you're going to philadelphia and you want to go to pass and Gino's, this is my recommendation you get just like you said you get a buddy one of you stands in line at pat's one of you stands in line at Gino's. you get a steak at pat's and you get cheese fries from Gino's. and cheese you fries then, you meet in the middle and that is the way that I recommend you do cheesesteaks in Philadelphia. You get a steak from Pat's, and you go get cheese fries from Gino's, and you meet in the middle. I've been to Pat's and Gino's more times than I'd, I'd like to admit, just for you know, with friends, you know, people visiting, and all that. I've never gotten anything other than just a imagine cheese taking a cheese whiz from the steaks and putting it on French fries. Ooh, I mean, I'd try it. I'm sure. I'm telling you, man, it's the proper way to do this. I mean, the problem that I have with Gino steaks is they're too dry. Pat steaks are nice and you know they're they're nice and juicy. Jim's are by far the fattest and the greasiest, which is why I, it's the best. I like uh, if Jim's on South is if someone's going to do the touristy thing, that's where I tell them to go. And now, South Street is also much much better spot than Passion Gap, which is a freaking haul. Yeah. So, Ron, let's get back to you. Sliced or diced? Ah. Uh. 
That's tough. Smothered, too. covered, chipped, diced. I love how you're getting right to Waffle House with that. But, <laughs> That's um, the only thing. When somebody says dice, it's the first thing I think of. I got to say, yeah, I think I like the dice a little bit better. But I'm with you. I was happy you you mentioned Denix because that's kind of always been my favorite place as well. So, but Reading I, Terminal is just a magical place. It's the it only is. way I can describe it. It's simply just magical. I've taken people there though for the Scrapple uh, breakfast from the Mennonites or whatever that one uh, place is. Those people are awesome too. It's the only place you'll see the Amish use cell phones. Yeah, and they have a great. They actually have a really amazing jerky booth of all things. If you've been there for that. I've gone to Reading Terminal to buy like pork shoulder and like they have literally everything. Like you can go in there and get an unbelievable lunch or you can go in there and walk out with like all of this funky Chinese vegetables that you've never you would never recognize. Like it has literally everything. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Alec, it's we're probably getting toward the end of our episode. And I have to say it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for giving us some tips and tricks on travel. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to get back out there and travel and really appreciate uh, all of the insights and wisdom you've shared with us. We'll have to have you back on in, in the future. Alec, parting words. You got any upcoming fun trips? What's going on this year? Well, so I'm not 100% sure this year. Um, we are taping this at the end of April. And right now they're deciding whether or not the EU is going to let us in. So we'll have to see where that goes. But I was thinking about possibly going to Egypt. I would say this is a very rare opportunity in the history of man that there is going to be a small gap in time. Go do things that are usually very crowded. So this would be an unbelievable opportunity to go to the Louvre as an example, or go to the British Museum, or go to see the pyramids in Egypt, or go do things that are usually so crowded that it's not fun. So we're going to have a six month window where we're going to be able to do things that are typically usually too overcrowded and not worth doing. And I really don't want to waste it. So for those of you listening at home, you got six months, take those points you've accrued and go do something fun because you're going to wish you did by Christmas. And with that, I, I don't think we can top that. That makes perfect sense. Now I'm, I'm starting to get FOMO already. I'm starting to think, well, where am I going to go? So maybe we'll talk about that on a future episode. Alec, it has been a real pleasure as when we worked together, we had our own show together called Demos with Alec and Alex. And so it's kind of fun that we're reuniting a little bit and that you are on my podcast with my brother between two studs. So it's been a real pleasure having you on and we certainly would love to have you on again at some point. Anytime. I'm always willing to talk to two studs. There you go. All right. With that, thank you. This concludes episode 21. We'll see you next time.